talking to these things. Well, that is um, an overwhelmingly generous um, introduction. I'm really just Jennifer, so please just call me Jennifer. I think as anybody is working with um, survivors or individuals of, of trauma or those of abuse, I think we just see ourselves as normal people doing what we can to build up others that didn't necessarily get the, the life um, that they deserve or desired. And so, um, Does the PowerPoint come on? Oh, it's on now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about kind of human trafficking on the Inland Empire. And I do want to say a, a minute because um, uh, although I'm coming from Riverside County, we do have our San Bernardino counterpart here tonight that runs the Coalition Against Sexual Exploitation, Sexual Exploitation and Michelle that is here. Can you stand just to, because I'm putting you on the spot. Um, we, um, in recognizing, as we'll kind of get into brief detail, is that um, our traffickers are, are, are um, move victims from county to county. So although we are separated um, kind of as, as agencies by this invisible line, our victims don't know this line. And so we need to have a great partnership together when we're providing victim services, recognizing that um, the more we work together, the better we empower and, and equip our survivors for their future. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about something a little bit daunting, and I think you already know because you're attending an event tonight that's based on human trafficking, and so you kind of know that necessarily we're not going to walk out the doors with this empowered feeling necessarily, but more of a, a heavy heart, but a heavy heart with I hopefully providing you direction and direction of, of how you can engage and how we can combat the issue together and really work together to support survivors um, and to minimize the traffickers' influence within our communities and societies. When we think about human trafficking, I think we really think about it on a global sp spectrum. We think about it in Cambodia, we think about it in Thailand, and we think about it in other nations that are facing it. And that's probably what we hear on the news. CNN will cover it, MSNBC will cover it, um, and it's happening on a global issue. But I think it's really hard for us to really think about it happening on a local level. But what we can say is that whether it's happening in Thailand, or it's happening in San Bernardino County, or it's happening in Riverside County, is the fact that it's about one thing only. It's about money at the end of the day. And it's about money on the, the backs of human beings, brothers and sisters, neighbors, friends and family members that are being treated more as commodities than they are as people, as humans. Um, and so money is really the tie that brings us and the world together, unfortunately. But what does it mean to happen in the Inland Empire? I think some of the things that are interesting is that um, when people do think about it, okay, if they're saying it, human trafficking is happening nationally, I think most of us would say, okay, we've heard maybe some news that it's happening nationally. But when we're seeing in Southern California, I don't think we're going to think Inland Empire. I think we'll think San Diego County, yes. LA County, yes. Orange County, yes. Just on the basis of infrastructure, based on their cities and more urban environments, but not necessarily San Bernardino and, and Riverside. Um, but the reality is, is that we have our own unique, uh, for lack of better words, flavor of what trafficking looks like. It's going to look different than it does in, San, in LA and San Diego, because one of the things is we're not a very heavy manufacturing um, two counties. We're not building textiles, we're not building infrastructures, we're more of a logistics hub, and logistics meaning we're more of a transportation so we're importing goods. Goods come to us and then we pass goods out. And so trafficking kind of finds its way in. We're also agriculture um, industries. Um, those, but those of us living more in, in, in kind of different um, communities, we're, we're seeing um, homes be built on our agriculture less than, um, than um, the, what our county holds. But we're really, we're rich in, in agriculture and environment. And we'll kind of get into how that infiltrates. But we really have unique, and what I love about this is this is the tourist of the Inland Empire. And so it's showing that we have connection with the mountains, with the desert, um, with the central area, as well as heading towards the coast. So we really have a unique impact of how, how tra traffickers can really utilize victims within the Inland Empire and traffic them within our own um, backyard. And so why does human trafficking exist? Um, I think, again, when it's on the back of money, um, that's a reality. There's estimates that it's a $28 billion to $32 billion industry globally. And so when we're looking at the, like, the gross national product of McDonald's plus Starbucks, and that equals the human trafficking, 
um, ramifications, we're seeing that this is a big industry. This isn't something that's just making a few little dollars for on the backs of a few people, but this is actually making millions and millions and billions of dollars um, worldwide. And so we can see. And why is it so profitable? Because we've realized, unfortunately, that people are reusable and resellable. Um, the fact that globally that we can make money and you trade a product and that product is a one-time transaction. You trade a person for that job, um, they can continue manufacturing and manufacturing and making and doing um, unlike uh, the product itself. And regionally, some of the interesting facts is that there is going to be a domestic issue as well as a foreign national issue. And so we're seeing that the Department of Homeland Security um, estimates that 12.3 million undocumented immigrants in the United States come to the United States and over 3 million are in California. And so when we're looking at those that are coming into our country, we're seeing that there are vulnerabilities. There's obviously risks that they're taking to come across borders, and there's risks and vulnerabilities that they take and are hands to predators and, and, and traffickers without. And then stats for our domestic population is that the National Human Trafficking Resource Center that's ran by the Polaris Project, if you've heard from them, um, estimates that there are hundreds of thousands, between 200 to 300,000 um, American youth that are at risk every year for being sexually exploited. Those are huge numbers of our domestic population and of our foreign national population that are at high risk of vulnerability within our communities. So what is trafficking? And so I'm going to take us to laws, and not necessarily to Boris, but to know that the federal government has behind us. We didn't all of us just say one day that there's trafficking now in our community and let's go do something about it, but the federal government actually in 2000, which means that these are really still very new laws, created the Trafficking Victim Protection Act. How many of us watched the movie Lincoln that just came out? Well, I didn't say it just came out. Only a few of you, you're missing out, it's very wonderful. Um, but the movie Lincoln was about one thing, about the 13th Amendment, that we are not a nation of slavery. And what the Trafficking Victim Protection Act is telling us is that slavery has uprooted itself again within our communities, but it looks different. It looks different than our Civil War time. It looks different um, than our, in, in our American history, but somehow it's uprooted itself, that, that we're using um, and profiting off of the backs of others within our community. And we need ways to um, investigate these cases and prosecute these cases. So this is really where the, um, the, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act comes in. And so we can see that labor trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, and obtaining. And something that's interesting about those words is that how many of us um, kind of have believed that when you are trafficked, you have to move from county to county, country to country, that there's movement involved? I think, I think that's a natural inclination, and especially when we think of drug trafficking. Drug trafficking, you're moving things around. But the last word in that, in that kind of first initial clause tells us obtaining, that somebody could be living in Loma Linda and be obtained within their own city and trafficked within their own city. They don't have to leave their city to be trafficked, and that's kind of an interesting dynamic that I think kind of um, we forget sometimes is that someone doesn't even leave their own hometown and can be trafficked. Um, for labor or services through the use of our three key words. Um, we have to prove that a victim is a victim um, through force, fraud, or coercion, whether they were beaten into it, tricked into it, lied into it, or threatened into it in order to be a victim of trafficking for the purposes of um, subjecting to involuntary servitude, peonage, de and debt bondage, and slavery. And so that's really kind of the, the facet. And I think the easiest thing to think about is a sweatshop mentality. So we think of sweatshops, we understand labor trafficking, but we'll get into kind of what does labor trafficking look like within our own backyard. And then sex trafficking, very, very similar definition. And so the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act, in which that commercial sex act is induced by, again, our three key words, by force, fraud, or coercion, or this one has a different clause at the end, or in which the person to perform such an act is under the age of 18. We already have laws that are protecting our children, laws that consent against, the, that the reality is, is a seven-year-old, a 10-year-old able to make this decision? No, so we're protecting them under the, under the federal mandate that they're an automatic victim of trafficking because we know a child can, isn't able to consent to an act like this. And so, but for any of our adults that we have to prove force, fraud, or coercion, we have to prove in some way, shape, or form that they were tricked into it, lied into it, threatened into it, or beaten into it. So what does labor trafficking look like within our, within our Inland Empire area? So it's gonna look like those in the hospitality industry. When I say hospitality industry, we're thinking restaurants, we're thinking hair salons, we're thinking nail salons, we're thinking massage parlors, we're thinking hotel industry within, within those environments of hospitality. Senior care centers, those that are working within hospice and senior living centers um, have been trafficked within. <clears throat> 
peddling and selling and vendors. That one takes a really unique place because um, how many of us have maybe purchased um, a tamale on the side of the road or fruits and vegetables from somebody and so had never really thought or even a flower bouquet. You're running late for an event and a party and you see someone selling flowers at the end of a, a, an off-ramp. Who would have thought that we'd be able to identify some of them as victims of trafficking because they were forced to do it, not because they were choosing to stand on that corner and stand in that area and sell? One of our cases was a young 16-year-old um, who was actually selling ice cream in one of those little ice cream carts at a park. And we would have never thought because he was selling ice cream at the end of um, at the outside of school hours, so we assumed he goes to school in the daytime, and then maybe as a family business and family help, he is pushing and selling ice cream. What we didn't realize is that his family was his trafficker. Um, he was being beaten at home if he didn't bring in a certain amount of money. Um, he had to sleep um, in different areas where other siblings got to sleep within rooms and on beds. He had to sleep with on the floor by the door. His items and possessions had to always remain outside, unlike the other siblings within the household. And he actually didn't go to school. He worked in another labor trafficking situation within a restaurant during the daytime where he could be hidden and seen. And so it looked like that he was going to school um, like the other children. But again, buying an ice cream from a kid, would we have thought, and thought that it was something different? No, we would have thought, no, this kid's just selling for his family or just selling to make summer money or whatever it may be, but happening in our own back doors. Other peddling and selling has actually been deaf community. Um, how many of us have seen someone that's deaf at the mall that's selling um, or passing like a pencil to you or passing like a little picture of like a, the, the uh, sign language alphabet to you? Yeah, many of us have and maybe we've purchased items from them. Who would have thought that many of them could be trafficking victims? We've got about 15 that are trafficking victims that are deaf um, and unfortunately, this is what they thought that they had to do in order to remain. They were tricked, they were lied, they were beaten, they were threatened into it. But who would have thought at the mall that it'd be something of that traumatic of someone coming to us? Someone could be trafficked within the landscaping and construction industry, within our farming and agriculture, um, those that are actually begging um, at the street corners or at the end of off-ramps. Um, those within domestic servitude. Domestic servitude is a really a difficult one because someone that's a domestic servant is living within a home and living within a home and providing the cooking, the cleaning, and maybe even taking care of kids within the home. And so they're difficult for law enforcement to identify because law enforcement isn't peering through our windows to see if someone is, is there. But the reality is that all of our domestic servants that have been identified have been identified by who? The neighbor. So how empowering is it for us to have eyes and ears? And this isn't necessarily for you to start snooping over into like the backyard of your neighbor and be like, I knew they were traffickers. Look how dirty they are. I mean, but that's not necessarily the idea. But the idea is that, yeah, their neighbors started to see, okay, somebody comes and goes, and um, the family comes and goes, but I feel like I've seen somebody else within that home. And then they provide a tip to law enforcement, and law enforcement will start to do an uncover, undercover investigation to just kind of do surveillance and begin to see, is there actually somebody else there? One of the greatest stories, because I, we, we have two that are right now at federal cases, so we're not allowed to disclose them, but I think a, a story that many people probably know is a young girl named Shima um, from Orange County's task force, and Shima was nine years old and was coming from Egypt. Um, and she was sold. Um, her parents sold her for a debt of $30. How many of us spent $30 just today, probably? Um, but $30 because they were in debt and coming from a different place of poverty and economics, and so they sold their daughter to a family that said, we're gonna take her to America, and we're gonna give her an American education, and we're gonna take care of her, and she's gonna go forward. And so to them, not only are they debt relieved, but they think their daughter's getting the education that they've always dreamed of, getting the services and care that she's always dreamed of coming to the United States. But who would have thought that they were sending their daughter to be a domestic servant, to never get to leave a house at nine years old for three years, to take care of two younger boys, to cook and clean and work 14-hour days within a home? That's not what they were necessarily thinking. But again, if it wasn't for a neighbor that noticed, Shima would never be where she is today, and today she's actually living in the Inland Empire um, and is working to um, work with Department of Homeland Security because she's 22 years old. She's gained her citizenship and had such a great in, um, impact and great influence by law enforcement that she wants to go into law enforcement and be an advocate um, for those that are like her within her situation. And then janitorial services. So we're seeing, is everybody a victim of trafficking within these industries? No. But are there some? Yes.
And then sex trafficking. I think this is probably where the media has um, voiced a little bit more and provided more of our efforts. If you've watched um, CNN's um, kind of newscasts of, of um, sex trafficking in America. And what we can see is that sex trafficking kind of takes a lot of different um, things. I think the, the common is, is prostitution, um, child pornography, massage parlors, brothels, escort services, modeling studios, um, and exotic dancing and stripping. And so does it mean that, again, everybody is a victim of trafficking within those? No. But does it mean there are trafficking victims within them? Yes. And I would say for both, um, for San Bernardino County and Riverside County, this is the majority of our population. Um, it's... We anticipated that we were going to get more foreign nationals and that that was going to be the, the services that we were going to be providing is that those that are being trafficked from other countries. But the reality is, is that 90% of my clients are U.S. citizens. Of those 90%, 80% of them are children. And that would be, um, and Michelle at San Bernardino case works with only children. And their caseload is off the charts. And so we're seeing that right now the look of our county our counties is really a face of a U.S. citizen, really a face of a child, um, and a child that is being exploited through child pornography, through prostitution, um, and through stripping and dancing. But how does someone become a trafficking victim? Because I think that's where for you and I, sometimes we kind of get a roadblock of how does this even begin? And there's two kind of um, theories, and these are my theories. These aren't necessarily um, research theories, but this is kind of my gut theories, is that we have a theory of taken. If any of us have seen the movie Taken, it's kind of more of this kidnapping abduction. And I think in most cases, this is where we, our brains say this makes sense. Someone being kidnapped and abducted and moved to another country and forced into sex slavery. And I think that makes sense because we don't understand why someone would maybe go into this by choice, um, that they had to be kidnapped into it. But the reality is none of our girls or boys go into this by choice. The reality is they're more like the story that my mom told me when I was a little girl of the frog in the kettle is that you can't put a frog within boiling water because what will the frog do? The frog will naturally jump out. But you put a frog within lukewarm water and you slowly turn the heat up and it relaxes the frog and allows the frog to be boiled. And it's a very crude parallel, but the reality is our girls aren't five years old and saying, I wish I was a prostitute when I grew up. Our girls are being abused, neglected, manipulated, and coerced and made to believe that this is the only option that they have. And so not all of them are, are, are in, the, in the sense of being taken, but all of them are being taken by their brains because they're being manipulated um, because of prior abuse they've experienced, because of other neglect that they've experienced. And so what are patterns between each of, uh, each of these um, victims? Um, common, and they're common patterns. Does it mean that every victim has these elements in their story, in their life, in their journey? No, but they may have some and they may have none. They may be the anomaly and be trafficked. Um, but the reality is for common for our US citizens that are, in, um, that are forced into sex trafficking is that they're gonna come from abuse and neglect backgrounds. Um, they're gonna come from, the statistics nationally show that 80 to 90% are sexually abused. Um, as a child. There's going to be some form of psychological trauma. Um, a grandparent pass away, a parent pass away, some significant person in their life um, that meant something that was kind of their rock to them um, was no longer there. Um, a difficulty what we're seeing a lot within both counties is our transitional aged youth, our emancipated foster youth um, that don't necessarily have all the tools that they need to survive on their own. And so what great recruitment is that? You need to survive? Here's a way to make quick money and they don't have the capacity and the options right now to, to choose other, other ways. And then those that run away from home. But how many of us probably in the shoes of a child that have been abused, neglected, sexually abused, and lost, wouldn't probably run away from the home that they were in. But that naturally, that running away puts them into more vulnerability um, into the hands of traffickers out in the streets. And our foreign nationals coming from economically uh, deprived countries and so they're coming from war-torn countries, civil wars. These are why we have language of like Arab Spring. Why do we have the language of Arab Spring? Is because of the Middle East conflicts. And what do we have is refugees coming over to other countries, fleeing for their own safety and for their lives. In 2008, Safe House, we started serving a lot of El Salvadorian population because of the civil wars happening in El Salvador. And so there was refugees coming up. And refugees are great. They're trying to find new turf. They're trying to find safety and freedom. But what are they also vulnerable to? those that are telling lies, those that are gonna deceive them and make promises to them that aren't necessarily the promises that they have. 
idealizations of the West. Look at Shima's family. She was promised an American education. That's a huge thing. I know as we kind of battle internally about the education system within America, the reality is we're still, it's still a prize thing in other countries, and that they are sending their children, sending their families um, to come here um, against all odds and against all risk, which just makes them very vulnerable. And I would say most of our trafficking victims have come across with visas, and all of the visas have been student visas, um, because that's the easiest visa to get, and they're promised what? An American education. And so again, the, the biggest lie that they um, are, are deceived into. And then coming from abuse and trauma and needing a way out. And so who are the victims? Really the victims are anybody. We don't like to necessarily say in either counties that it's just this population, it's just this demographic, but we're seeing it affect on all local backgrounds. We're seeing it actually affect those that don't necessarily fall into those roles of, I have girls that were getting their bachelor's degree didn't come from parents of abusive situations and were trafficked. Um, we have a young lady that and Michelle and I both work with, a, a survivor, Rachel Thomas, that was coming from a family of a, of a pastor and was living a beautiful life and was recruited because she is, she's breathtaking and was recruited in the modeling industry. And so she was going into modeling and was recruited within modeling um, and found herself as a sex slave overnight. And so it's not always certain types of groups, certain types of people. The reality is it has affected all spectrums. And so the face, again, of our current victims that we've shared about is some are foreign nationals and some are just girls. Um, but the reality is, is that um, I'll use the female pronoun a lot. We have had several male survivors, but the majority is still female. We're looking at a heavily um, abused population of women within our communities and girls. But I want to introduce, because I feel like there's only so many statistics that we can hear, only so many um, stats, awareness, things like that that is applicable, but I think it's more applicable to hear to, in the life of someone that has experienced um, beyond what we could. And I want to introduce a young lady that has more strength and more courage. I know I'm going to embarrass you. I'm not going to cry. Um, more strength and more courage than I have seen in my entire life that I wish I could muster within my thumb, within my pinky finger. Um, she has shown bravery against all odds, bravery against odds of what her family believed she was capable of do, what she believes that she's capable of do, and said, I'm, I'm gonna go farther, and I'm gonna make a difference in my life, and my life is gonna be changed for the good no matter what I've experienced. Um, but let me introduce you to tell her story of Cassandra Kohler. Hello, I'm Cassandra Kohler, and I'm 19, and I'm going to tell you guys some of my story. Um, like she said, it starts off, you wouldn't end it. I started off at six years old. I was molested by a family member of mine, and then my family just fell apart. My mom, she's been addicted to painkillers my whole life. I don't remember a time of her not being up excuse me, not being on them. My parents got divorced at age 10. My sister started doing drugs, and my nana, who was my best friend, my rock, person I spent every day with, passed away all in the same year. Then, as my parents got divorced, my mom got heavier and heavier on her medication, and she got remarried and got married to someone that had two kids already, so, I was 11 years old taking care of my mom who could not function on her own, myself, and two younger step-siblings step I had had. Um, at age 13 is when I started hanging out with the older crowd, thinking I was cool because I look much older than I am, and I just fell into that. I had people give me false promises, telling me that I was beautiful, that they could show me so much better than what I had. I came from a broken home, I came from abuse, I came from all the worst things, and having someone tell me that those things it just meant, meant the world to me. Once I, I entered the life at age 13, I was promised the world, and I didn't receive anything. I was threatened on an hourly and daily basis. Um, I have, I was, beaten on a daily basis. I have cigarette burns 
from not doing what I was told. I was burned with boiling water. And still to this day, I have scars all over my skin from of all of that happening. And I see them everywhere, but I don't let it keep me down anymore. And at age 17, I exited the life and I testified in a case against my abuser. I've been out of the life now for two years and I'm really happy, like, this is the happiest I've been in my entire life. Um, I graduated high school. I made up 125 credits in, the, in one year. I got... Um, I'm currently enrolled in UEI, a trade school, to become a medical assistant. I graduate in July with my medical assistant certification, and then I'm going to phlebotomy school as well in April. So watch out for your arms. Watch out. <laughs> um, I just got my driver's license today. Yay. <laughs> but with... With all the support and everything I've had, I have Jennifer, she's amazing. I also have a mentor, her name is Rose, and a therapist, Carolyn. Without them, I don't believe I would be the person I am now because they've helped me build up my self-esteem and helped me see that I'm worth something, I deserve the best, and if I want it, I can have it. And most people don't think about, oh, something's going on with them, they're acting out, there's nothing wrong, they just have a bad attitude. But some people, they don't know how to show you that they need help, they can't speak up for themselves. So like the little cues, like from coming from a broken home, constantly mad or constantly being acting out, people just need someone to talk to sometimes. Just sit down and talk to them and not have anyone judge them. That's all they want. And today, I have a saying that I live by. It's, I am who I am today, not because of what has happened to me, but in spite of it. And I think everyone just open, just this is like an eye opener to see like it's happening everywhere and just be a shoulder to cry on, someone to talk to for everybody because that's all we really need. So, thanks. <laughs> that's how you stand there with you cry. And so now you have to be fearful on the road because she's out there now. Um, but I think the, the reality, I think, um, Cassandra kind of um, hit on kind of two things is one, her mentor. And we were even talking on the, the drive today and she's just like, so my mentor, so Rose doesn't get paid. I said, nope, doesn't get paid to hang out. Um, and I said, and every time she takes you out to dinner, every time she takes you out to lunch or things like that, doesn't get paid that back. And that, she just kind of was like, ha, ah. like that is love is what she told me. Um, because there's nobody um, at the end of the day that's getting paid behind it. That It's just a dedicated person that's become her friend, mentor, um, woman that she respects, woman that she admires, that has embraced her and not judged her. And has empowered her through. And I would say sometimes um, she calls Rose first before she calls me now. And I'm like, oh, but that's a good thing. That's how it should be, is that um, the community wraps around and comes alongside. And we can say at the beginning that when I first introduced them, um, Cassandra stepped out afterwards and was like, she's too happy. <laughs> and I said, well, what, what, what do you mean? Like, oh, she's way too happy, too nice. I don't think this is going to be good. I said, well, just give it one more time. Like, let's just go hang out. Um, and the reality is that there is that pushback um, because Sandra didn't want someone that close in her life. She didn't know if that person was going to let her down, that person not provide the trust that she was looking for because that's what she has seen. And so the fact that Rose has kind of stepped above that and made that impact and says, I will, I will show up and I will be there has been huge. And I would say that's probably the largest things as we move into kind of um, our fourth P of our task force that we um, aim to um, protect, prevent, prosecute, and partner in this partnership. Um, it's really, I think, as Cassandra said, it's a no judgment. Um, and it's a I will, I'm committed um, for the long haul. And not just because it's easy, um, because the road is messy and the road is difficult. Um, Cassandra shared 
briefly of amazing things that she has triumphed and done, but she would tell you on the sign, it hasn't been easy. And there have been setbacks and there have been defeats. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's, that's the reality is that the road isn't necessarily always easy. So what can you do? One thing you're doing tonight is you're attending trainings to get informed, to become aware. Um, through both of our um, um, county um, efforts, we have kind of speaker bureaus where you can be empowered to educate in the community. Um, we have trained the trainer workshops. Become aware of the signs. Um, start book clubs um, or movie clubs. Um, and we can give you, both of us, uh, and Michelle and myself, could give you a list of books and movies that we would recommend to start. And that also empowers others to get informed and to get educated. Um, to host different events um, or keep attending your reach events. Um, get on our, either of our task force mailing lists, um, share with others, and we'll get to what the hotline is and donate to support uh, survivors like Cassandra. So some hotlines to know is that um, our task force has a specific hotline that goes um, directly to law enforcement, um, but both of us um, countywide use the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. Um, when we say hotline, I will caveat and say it's really a cold line, so if you're calling with like an emergency situation, they'll actually have you hang up with them and call 911 because that will happen directly because in a cold line, we hear about the news about 24 hours later, and so really it's a great thing. So I would, if you haven't plugged out your cell phone yet, because I know all of you have a cell phone in this room, I would encourage encourage you to take it out and to type in 1-888-3737-888. And it's written funny only because we remember it when it's written funny. Um, but all the numbers are, are there. Um, but the reality is, or you can text be free. And that also goes to them. We actually just recovered a survivor that texted herself. So she actually found the hotline and text be free and was um, texting them. And we were able to recover her about two weeks ago. And so we're seeing survivors call, but we're also seeing tips and leads come through. I'm seeing some people write it down, so that's why I'm not changing slides. But really, this is the great thing. So even if you think, um, I had one young lady, a part of our task force, and she had been actually training her, her church about the 888 number and said, everybody needs to do this. And then all of a sudden, she came across an interesting scenario that she had passed by um, along the freeway, and she called me first. She's like, I don't know if I should call the hotline. Do you think I should call the hotline? I'm not sure if this is hotline worthy. Do you think it's hotline worthy? And I said, well, what are you training your, your, your community of faith at your church? And she said, to call the hotline. And I said, well, that's probably like the thing to do. But she, she just doubted herself in that moment if it's trafficking or not. And the reality is you don't have to be the one to determine if it's trafficking or not. You just see something suspicious, something that doesn't seem right. And there's great things that we do is that we start polling. So the more descriptive you can be, the better, because we actually started seeing that there was a young girl that was nine years old that was selling lanterns and that someone had given a tip and she was found in Victorville, she was found in Palm Springs, and then she was found in Coachella Valley. And so the reality is that we noticed that the same girl was being called in. Why is a nine-year-old being tracked around? And then this allowed law enforcement to find enough leads to go out and begin investigations to, to find out what, what is this nine-year-old doing and why is she being identified in such very far terrain from each other. So trust that, as my mom says, that mama gut instinct. Um, I'm not sure for all the men in the room, the papa gut instinct or maybe, um, but trust that instinct and call because it really is the best way to, to put hands and eyes to, to it. Become a safe place partner. We can help you understand what that is, but one of the great things is connecting with businesses. If you're a local business owner or if you um, know local business owners, a safe place is a great place for youth to know. Um, a youth can go in, your staff are trained and educated to point them into safe directions. Within Riverside County, we just had every McDonald's within the Coachella Valley, within the Eastern Desert, um, become a safe place partner. And since then, it's happened in the last two weeks, we've had three recoveries of youth being brought to safety. So instead of them being vulnerable and victimized, um, on the streets, they know that there's a safe place to go to, and now they can get into a safe contact within either of our counties. So become a safe place partner. Um, and then the last is we all have services for these youth, um, but the reality is, and, and for victims, um, the reality is, is we don't do it alone. As you heard, we had a team, a team of people that come around. That's how CASE operates as well, is that we recognize that it's not one village, not one, we're not one agency that can really provide the services that every victim needs. We realize that we need a plethora of partners um, because every victim's needs is different, every, every survivor's story is different, and every survivor's dream of what she hopes or he hopes life can be is different. And so we know all the tools um, all the resources at the table to really empower her or him to move him forward. <laughs>